your mic. Okay. Good morning, everyone. This is Denise Prager, Membership Manager for the FAT. Thank you for joining us today, and welcome to our presentation. Uh, this webinar will be approximately an hour long and is being recorded. A copy of the recording will be sent to you after the webinar. As a reminder, if you have any comments or questions for Sarah, please type them in the Q&A box. Sarah Schlody is a registered psychotherapist in private practice in Ontario, Canada, and founder of Equisoma. More and more people are drawn to programs that focus on healing with horses to support their trauma recovery. This presentation offers a review of the physiology of trauma in mammals, in particular horses and humans, through the lens of somatic experiencing and the polyvagal theory. Welcome, Sarah. Thanks, Denise. We've got somebody asking about the sound before we get started, so I don't know if we need to address that. Can, Sonia, can you hear me okay? If she can type we that as a response. Make it louder from this point. They can only make it louder from there. Okay. So okay. Hmm. okay. Does that help at all, Sonia? Is that better? Yes. Okay. Great. I'm just turning up the sound on my phone, so hopefully that'll be a bit clearer. Okay. Good. 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 Excellent. Well, welcome everybody. Thanks so much, Denise, for the introduction. We uh, have a jam-packed hour ahead of us, and uh, I wanted to just get started really uh, off the get-go. Um, there are a number of slides in this presentation, including this one, that are actually videos. And because we were having difficulty with the video feature um, of Adobe Connect, what we'll do after the presentation is over is send you the link to the videos so you can watch them after the fact on your own time. Uh, it's unfortunate because this first video had an orienting practice with horses, and so um, you'll have to watch that separately. But um, let's just pretend that we had a chance to have some orienting with the horses and the herd this morning, and then we'll just continue from there. So um, perhaps in this moment right now, wherever you're located, you could orient to your current surroundings. Notice the support of the chair or the bed that you're sitting on or lying on. It's early in the morning for you. Um, and just take a few moments to settle into your, your body and your surroundings right now. So Equisoma was born out of uh, what a number of people have noticed about somatic experiencing is that since it is a mammalian-based model, um, that the underpinnings of SE and the theory of SE applies directly not just to humans but other animals as well. And so um, even Peter Levine um, noticed this as well and, and talked a little bit about how the horse is a metaphor for the human body. And the horse is also not just a metaphor. They're an animal that we can build a relationship with. Um, they're not just a projective device. And so I, I, I thought it was really important that we start with just acknowledging that there's a really lovely parallel between um, the work of Peter and this idea of working with mammalian nervous systems, especially in the context of equine-assisted therapy. Um, so we're going to go more into that as time goes on over the course of today. This was taken last summer with the herd at the farm where we board our horses. Um, and um, I found it very, very interesting to work with a really natural herd. So the horses that we board um, live in a herd of 60 horses that roam over about 100 acres. Uh, and so they have a really um, different kind of experience uh, of life than a lot of captive horses do. Uh, so I do want to speak a little bit to that today in terms of what happens under captivity conditions for both humans and horses, and also how we can apply this in the context of equine-assisted therapy. So um, as you all know, most of you, I believe, are SE trained. Uh, there may be a few people who are not from our community, but just as a brief overview, so as Peter discovered, animals in the wild who are often uh, routinely facing threats to their existence um, don't often get traumatized. And so we know why this is the case in SE, which is having to do with moving through the immobility response uh, and deactivating or discharging that survival energy that um, that happens. Whatever goes up must come down. And in the wild or under more or less natural conditions, this gets to happen without any inhibition more or less. 
Um, and uh, Robert Sapolsky wrote a book called Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers, which I wanted to put a nod to in this presentation, as zebras are also equines and cousins of horses. Um, and it speaks to this idea that under optimal conditions, which is what SE is all about, setting the conditions for recovery, um, but under the optimal conditions, we don't see the issues in wild animals that we see in, in um, domesticated species. And this is true for humans, but also for other animals like horses, too. And animals will come in and out of um, the freeze response. They'll mobilize a stress response. They'll use it to get safe. And then they will come back down to a state of ventral vagal social engagement or um, rest and digest, sort of low tone dorsal vagal response. Um, and so this happens all the time. And I, I find it happens a lot more in the large herd where we board our horses. That they have the space to roam. They have the space to move away. Um, they have the, the freedom and the forage and the friends, which I find is really, really lovely for them. Um, but what we do know, of course, um, from our knowledge of SE is that um, animals that are in captivity uh, do not often get a chance to experience this natural ebb and flow of the nervous system with life. So uh, humans in particular, for example, as Peter will say, live in a social cage. So um, we don't want to appear weak. We, you know, we rationalize. We learn to live in our heads. We disconnect from our bodies. Shame for, you know, for we all have a lot of academic training, you know, learn to think through your head, learn things by heart, et cetera. So we, we have a lot of um, programming and learning that shapes us to be very disconnected from our bodies and not really work through those responses. We also live in a society that doesn't really allow some of those responses to happen. So we live in a lot of circumstances where running away isn't always a possibility. And also acting out a fight response could lead to criminal charges, right? We're not allowed to fight back or defend ourselves uh, the way animals do in the wild because the police will come. Um, and in many places, self-defense is actually not um, considered valid um, and people can actually get charged for trying to defend themselves. So we have all these reasons why we override uh, our self-protective responses. Um, another really big reason why we don't get a chance to work through these chronic stressors is that we captivity conditions that humans and animals live in um, have a lot of chronic stressors. So there's in the wild, things are pretty quick. I mean, there's a predator coming. You're either going to run and mobilize a response and get away, or you're going to fight back and you're going to win, or you're going to go into an immobility response, and it ends there. Um, but domesticated species, including humans, um, are exposed to a lot more chronic stressors that don't um, resolve as quickly or don't resolve at all, um, which also further impacts the nervous system. So we see this with um, confined animals, so animals in the circus industry, entertainment industries, uh, food production, uh, animals that are involved in laboratory testing, uh, and so on, animals on factory farms. Uh, animals that are in um, backyard sort of breeding operations uh, and so on, uh, puppy mills and so on. So there's a lot of captivity conditions that will create thwarted survival energy where it's not possible to actually work through what is held in the nervous system. And so when that happens, as we all know, um, self-regulation is disrupted, flow is disrupted, uh, and we're left holding all this bound activation in our nervous system. Uh, Peter Payne and Marty Crane Godro, who I met at the USADP conference um, in California this past fall, um, state that any of these preparatory states that we have that are oriented to escape, attack, um, sexual activity, exploration, nurturance, et cetera, so it's not just fight or flight responses. We have preparatory actions that we use to move towards a lot of things, including nourishment, whether that's social nourishment, food nourishment, um, curiosity, exploration, play. Um, that also involves mobilization. And when those things are thwarted, not just self-protective responses, we're going to see a lot of different kinds of forms of distress, as we know. Um, and so that energy stays locked in the nervous system uh, and shows up as a number of different problematic uh, behaviors, as we know. And we see this in horses and in humans. I just had a podcast um, not too long ago where I talk a little bit about um, the problems with anthropomorphization. Um, because people will say, well, you know, horses are horses, and you can't say that they're feeling a particular emotion, and, you know, and then, but we will then say, oh, but they're happy, but we won't say, oh, they're in pain or they're in distress. Um, and 
I'm promoting through this presentation today this idea of mammaliomorphism, which um, I think sort of Peter talks about so lovely in his animal model that underlies SE, which is that although there are differences among cell species, you know, we also share a lot of common traits. And some of the common traits that we share between horses and humans are that we have a nervous system that responds to threat. We have the ability to socially engage and seek out comfort and attach and, you know, look for um, play and look for safety. Uh, we have the ability to mobilize responses to threat. We have the similar responses to long-term chronic stress. So this slide here in particular, when we're not able to meet our needs, when we're not able to uh, su support uh, a, a healthy mobilization of a response, we're going to see different, similar issues in horses and in humans, other mammals as well. You could argue that this applies to dogs and rats and so on. Um, but we'll see hypervigilance or hypovigilance, the tendency to not be oriented or connected to our surroundings, uh, dysregulation, uh, anxiety, aggression, and acting out behaviors, fidgeting, you know, that sort of that, you know, self-stimulating, um, incomplete responses, you know, I can't move, so I'm going to sort of, you know, fidget a little bit. We're going to see that. Difficulty settling, defeat, depression, shutdown, and submission responses, learned helplessness, immobility responses of various kinds, dissociation. We'll see insecure attachment patterns. This does occur in other mammalian species, not just humans. We'll talk a little bit about that today. Um, fawning or appeasement behaviors to try to get, you know, the pain or the confusion or the stress to stop. Uh, different management strategies, which we call management strategies or accommod uh, defensive accommodations, to use Kathy Kane's language and Steve Terrell's language, um, or in uh, obsessive compulsive behaviors, addictions. But in the animal world, we'll call those stereotypies or um, stereotypical behavior or stable vices. Um, you know, which, you know, in humans, we don't really call addiction vices very much anymore because we know it's not about having a lack of morals uh, or willpower, although some people still believe that. But we still call them stable vices, which I find a little frustrating because it really undermines um, and dismisses the fact that it's a normal reaction to frustrating conditions um, or captivity conditions. So, um, you know, I think there's more and more people now that are going to call those things in horses obsessive compulsive behaviors or stress responses or addictions uh, and so on. But there are still a number of people who do not. Um, and various health syndromes, as we know as well, from the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, which interestingly, I have not seen this yet, um, but I would love to see a version of the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study conducted with horses, uh, because there's all this research on, you know, um, all the bad things that happen with humans and what causes health issues in adulthood. Um, we're starting to see this more with other animals as well. So for instance, this is a, an image from a study uh, looking at um, uh, ulcers in foals that are weaned early. And we know from early developmental trauma there are early separations, uh, born premature in an incubator, you know, we don't receive touch, we're separated, we go into foster care. Early separations will lead to more gastric problems in humans as well. We see this with foals. And unfortunately, foals are often removed from their mums really young or too young, younger than they would be in the wild under natural conditions. Um, and so this particular study, there's a number of studies that look at this, um, looking at ulcers and foals and the impact of stress on that. Um, but I would love to see a more widespread study, kind of like we did with the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study for, for horses. I think that would be a really neat thing to see. Um, but we, we know this as well, you know, in terms of the responses. If I go back a slide, um, obsessive compulsive behaviors and addictions, animals, lab animals um, that have been separated from their mums that don't receive touch, uh, that even for a short period of time we're not able to receive licking and touch from their mums are more likely to use substances when they're presented in the cage. So are more likely to use cocaine, are more likely to drink alcohol, uh, are more likely to have aggressive responses, are more likely to have difficulty with integrating into um, society with other members of their own kind, um, and so on. And we see this as humans as well, right? Humans who have early developmental trauma also have these issues with addictions and obsessive compulsive disorders. And so I like to lay the land out a little bit to start off like this because there's so many parallels. Yes, there are differences. We cannot treat horses the way we treat humans, but we can't throw out the baby with the bathwater. So there's this mammaliomorphism, as I call it, 
if you try to do Google search it, you probably won't find it except for on my website. I, don't, I haven't seen it anywhere in the literature, but I'm proposing that we use language like mammaliomorphism to speak to the fact that there are shared characteristics, shared responses to threat. We all have a nervous system and a personality and a life history that impact our experiences of life. So uh, in sometimes very similar ways as we're seeing here. Um, I want to speak a little bit more uh, about natural versus captivity behavior before I talk a little bit more about equine assisted therapy. So one um, common perspective that happens is that, uh, or one common view that we see, and the most common view I think about horse um, behavior is that horse herds are hierarchical in nature. Um, it's based on dominance, you know, which horse is in charge, which horse moves the other horse, in where's the pecking order, who's the most dominant, who's the most passive. As if these are roles or states that are permanent within herds. What's interesting is uh, Lucy Reese, uh, who's a mythologist who's I think originally from Britain but lives in Spain, uh, and a number of her colleagues have been studying wild, feral, or free-living horses for many, many years, and have found that in the wild under, again, natural conditions, not under captive conditions, but under natural conditions, horses in the wild do not show evidence of hierarchies. There's stallions and stallions have, you know, behaviors that they engage in. But for the most part within the herd, there is far less aggressive responses um, and far more affiliative behaviors, which is quite different from what we see in captive horse populations, where there's a lot more jostling for position and ears pinning and get away from that food pile, it's mine, you know, and there's a lot more of this that happens in, 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 um, in domesticated species. Um, so what's interesting is that this lines up with what we know polyvagal theory is that, you know, baseline is going to be ventral vagal, right? We're going to be more, uh, it's a more sustainable physiology to be in a ventral vagal state where we're socially engaged, we're in affiliation with one another, mobilizing stress responses when necessary and going into high tone freeze um, when it's completely threatening to do so, or, you know, that the threat in, requires us to do so, um, and which, you know, matches a lot more what we see with wild, this sort of matches more what we see with wild herds. Um, so affiliation is actually the norm more so in the wild, which is so interesting. And this comes back to what we talk about in SC all the time, that the conditions are different, that conditions allow for something different to emerge. So in the wild, horse bands are self-selected. So they choose who they get to hang out with. They choose who they band with, so to speak. So there's less inner conflict within the herd. Domesticated herds are often, you know, we board horses at facilities where the horses don't get to pick who they are in a small paddock with. Often paddocks are smaller. Um, and so they can't always get away. They're having to tolerate a horse that they don't necessarily like. So we're going to see more conflictual behaviors. Um, again, foals are weaned early in, or in captivity, but not always weaned early um, in the wild. They stay with their moms for upwards of one to two years and sometimes remain longer within certain bands depending on their sex. Um, and so they have a chance not only to experience regulation and co-regulation, um, and wean at their own pace, but they also get to learn social norms and they're not exposed, um, their brains can develop differently than if they were um, separated really, really young where we see a lot of the developmental trauma happen. So they have fewer impulse control issues, aggression issues that we see with early maternal deprivation. Um, and I, I just said they're not confined to paddocks where they are, have an ability or a, a limited ability to set boundaries uh, and experience distance from horses they don't like, for instance. And so we're going to see more of that, those stress responses in captive herds um, than in the wild. Um, also, um, you know, as we know, um, Kathy Kane, I love her language around this, there is high cost to living in certain nervous system states more of the time. So, so the frequent use of the sympathetic gas pedal, for instance, to be not just, sympathetic isn't always bad, right? So there's play and there's sex and there's exploration and all these things require a certain amount of gas pedal. But the higher tones of sympathetic, so fight or flight type responses, um, frequent use of that end of the spectrum is a higher cost of living. So it's not sustainable physiology, it's survival physiology. Um, and so when we're living in that state more of the time, um, and we're infighting within the herd, that leaves less energy available to actually mount a response to outside threats. It's not a sustainable way of living, which, we, again, we don't see in the wild herds. Wild herds do not have as much conflict behavior uh, and sympathetic stress responses within the herd as a normal way of being. Again, this really comes down to captivity conditions. 
Um, there's also not as there's no human interference, of course, or training methods that reinforce dominance or submission hierarchy. So a lot of training methods for horses will reinforce those kinds of aggression responses, um, especially if there's a lack of attunement or we're using more traditional methods of horse training. So we'll see that as well. Um, and not having to fight over limited resources. So some people will say, oh, it's hierarchies or it's aggression or that horse is more aggressive than the other horse, uh, and that's the hierarchy and the pecking order in the herd. But Lucy and other, other of her colleagues would say, or is that just resource guarding? Right? There's a perceived not enoughness. Too many of us in a small space, there's not enough perceived, and so therefore we're going to respond that way. Um, and so is it actually aggression or hierarchy, or is it literally just a response to scarcity? And so um, this, I love the Fed Up Fred website. If you want to go take a look, feel free to check it out, fedupfred.com. There's a lot of really cool cartoons on there uh, and illustrations talking about some of these concepts. Uh, it's hard to see this one specifically on the screen. You might be able to zoom in, um, but the, um, I think the link is in the references section at the end. But basically, the owner is saying, oh, look at this horse pinning its ears at the other horse. It's, it's the boss. It's the dominant horse. That other horse is more passive. Um, and Fred, who's the horse wearing the binoculars next to her, is going, you know, I don't think that's what's actually going on. This particular horse is older and, um, you know, is, is showing aggression to, do, you know, to resource guard that particular pile of hay. And that other horse is moving away saying, I don't want to be involved here. I, I'm going to give in to you. But that doesn't mean that that's always going to be the case with those horses. And in fact, in a herd, ho any horse can move another horse. It's not always going to be hierarchical. Right, so um, they've done some really neat video studies showing videos of horses moving other horses within a herd, and the, whoever's lead, whoever's making the other horse move changes depending on the herd. So it's really um, neat to see that it's not always so linear. Uh, and again, we're looking for more affiliation responses, and that's really what we do in SC2. We try to set the tone by building the capacity to come back to ventral vagal, back to social engagement. That's our natural state as mammals. Um, is affiliation, and, and a lot of these stress responses prevent us from having that in effective way. So we know this, again, from polyvagal theory. So um, the limbic system modulates sympathetic arousal through social engagement, which diffuses aggression and tension through various different um, social responses like appeasement, um, fawning behaviors, uh, and also seeking out, um, seeking out our friends and our allies when we're wanting to feel safe or feel soothed. Um, Porges, as we know, talks about how that's linked to eye contact. The ventral vagus innervates the musculature of the face, the parts of the body involved with social engagement. This is true with horses, too. Um, horses that are feeling more calm, more settled, more connected, you'll see the facial expression be a lot softer, a lot calmer, right? The eye will soften. Um, then a horse that's more in a threat response or feeling unsafe or insecure, where the facial expression will show that tone. Um, and when we're in a VVC, we're more likely to be in curiosity, exploration, connection, and feel that felt sense of safety. So once again, ventral vagal, and then sympathetic, and then dorsal vagal. So again, horse herds in the wild will have that progression as well, more so. In, in domesticated herds, it's a lot more chaotic and disorganized for some herds more than others. Um, so we know about the dorsal vagus. I'm just going to flip through this pretty quickly because it's not as important. Um, I, I wanted to just point this out here because I, I thought I love this cartoon. If you check out vacanttalk.com, there's also a lot of really great nervous system cartoons there for your own edification. So feel free to take a look at that if you like. Um, so in a horse herd, there's going to be times where there's, similar with humans, there's parasympathetic dominance. So low tone dorsal vagal response, rest and digest, right? So in this particular case, we've got a, a certain amount of rest and digest, low tone dorsal vagal at play. The horses are grazing. They're grazing slowly. They're not grazing in a stress response, which would be a lot faster and more, like nervous grass picking. Um, and social engagement, which is the ventral vagal tone, I can socialize, right? I'm able to be here. So these are these lower states of the nervous system that are part of the parasympathetic um, low end of the parasympathetic that are supporting wellness and well-being. Um, play um, is, again, part of that sympathetic nervous response that's tempered by the ventral break so that it's not actually going into fight or flight. It's a high amount of sympathetic arousal tempered by the ventral break that allows me to stay in social connection, which is what we're seeing, what we're seeing here. This, these two horses are in the herd. This last photo and this photo are from the herd um, where we board our horses. Um, and um, just showing some of that. 
um, I'm bringing this up because I, it's important to lay the groundwork for what I'm going to talk about next. So a really quickly brief overview. So in development with attachment, because horses are mammals as well, uh, they are going to experience the developmental process of auto-regulation, co-regulation, and self-regulation, um, which um, Porgia speaks about, but also Kathy Kane and other people within the SE community. Um, auto-regulation is online first. Sometimes we don't even have that if we're born too soon. Um, but auto-regulation is the things that get us you know, they, our heart rate is going, our, our body temperature can regulate itself, you know, we can, our breath knows how to take itself, you know, we don't have to think to make those things happen. Co-regulation is that dyadic pinging, that resonance that we have with another nervous system that we can only really experience with another nervous system. Um, and when we experience more of that co-regulation, our nervous system learns what comes up, must come down. We don't live in high states of distress because we experience soothing and our brain and our body can attend to the tasks of living and development as opposed to being in survival energy all the time. Over time, because our brain is developing properly, our conditions are met, we're able to go into self-regulation and learn that over time. The nervous system is able to do that without necessarily needing to be in proximity to others. Components of attachment, that comes from Bowlby uh, and Ainsworth. Um, and so the components of attachment we see are safe haven. So this idea that the conditions feel safe, my environment is safe, the humans in my environment are responsive. They're, they're attuned, they're empathetic, they're soothing, they play, they, they engage, right? They see me, I feel seen. That's part of that safe haven experience. Once that's there, um, I experience a secure base. So once I have my, as I grow and develop, I can go out into the world and explore the world and come back to my caregiver knowing that it's there to help support me, um, protect me as necessary, and then I leave the secure base to go back out into the world and explore the world. Um, and we're going to seek proximity to our secure base and we're going to experience separation distress when we're away from the secure base. And over time, secure attachment means that I am going to be able to internalize a sense of that secure base and safe haven, even if I'm not near that. And I know it exists even if I'm not around it. Um, this is a video that I will send you the link for. It's not from our farm, um, but it's on YouTube. And it's a really lovely little video of a foal um, in a ventral vagal state with a Sharpe dog. Um, and they're showing exploratory orienting. They're showing curiosity with one another. Uh, and then there's a little bit of play arousal. Some, some, some sympathetic charge starts to come up. And then the foal runs back to its mom as a secure base response to deactivate. And then comes back out a little bit and does a little bit of play and then runs back to mom. So it, it's just this idea that horses are not that dissimilar from us. Um, there are a lot of things that are similar um, with regards to that. Another one is neuroception. Um, so that ability to detect safety, danger, or life threat is also something that we share with horses, which makes equine-assisted therapy so potent as a modality. So we'll talk a little bit about that next. This is a video that I also will send you a link to um, that we can't show, unfortunately, today, but um, that we will send you the information about. It's a herd of horses in, Cal in um, not California, in Florida. Uh, it looks like it's, it looks like a golf course. I don't think it's a golf course, though. Um, but there's an alligator. And there's a herd of horses off to the right, and there's a horse that's kind of playing sentinel and, and looking out for the band, uh, and eventually goes and fights the alligator, and then comes back. The alligator walks away, uh, and the horse goes back to ventral vagal engagement with its herd, um, showing that sort of mobilization of a fight response and coming down. Because we talk about horses as flight animals, but horses also mobilize fight. They mobilize fawn. They, they have um, behaviors where they tend to befriend. They, they have the gamut of self-protective responses, not just flight. So similar to humans in that way, although the primary responses will be different. So we know about neuroception already. I'm going to um, skip through that. Um, so let's move into this idea of equine-assisted therapy. So I wanted to set the tone by talking a bit of a brief overview of some of the, the science and the, the theory base that we come from in SE um, and why this applies to horses as well, because that's going to set the tone for this understanding of why equine-assisted therapy can be so potent. And I'm going to speak about a very specific kind of equine-assisted therapy uh, because there's so many different types out there. Therapeutic riding is not the same thing, you know, um, although I'm sure some of these benefits occur in these other modalities. Um, there are so many different versions of equine-assisted 
uh, interventions that doing a presentation on that would take up an entire day. Um, so I'm not going to go into that here, but there is more information about that on my website. But I'm going to speak specifically about types of equine-assisted um, interventions that really focus on somatics and nervous system and um, attachment, um, as there are, there are versions of that that, that um, people do use. So Bessel van der Kolk says that insight does not quiet down the limbic system, as we all well know. Um, so how do you quiet down the frightened animal inside you? The answer to that is probably in the same way that you quiet down babies. You quiet them by holding and touching by being very much in tune with them, by feeding and rocking, and by very gradual exposure to trying new things, which isn't that what we do in SE. So, and some of the um, post-advanced trainings after SE um, talk a little bit more about attachment and attunement and relational rupture and repair as well. So this is all part of this bigger scope of practice for us as SE people, and that's what we're doing with horses too. Horses have experienced trauma in relationship with humans, especially because of captivity conditions, as of humans. And so, as we always say, what you know, if, if trauma occurs in relationship, then healing can occur in relationship as well. Um, so, limbic remodeling. Uh, this comes from a book called uh, A General Theory of Love by Lewis and his colleagues. Um, and this is, again, what we do in SD and attachment work. So we start off with limbic resonance, which is that pinging between two mammals when they're attuning to each other's space. So attunement is what we do in SD, is <laughs> what most of the training is. Um, but it's what we're doing when we're spending time with horses as well. Um, limbic regulation is the responding to the cues in order to support soothing comfort regulation, growing the window of tolerance, right? Um, and then there's going to be limbic revision, which is integrating the new neural template for a sense of safety, a neuroception of safety in relationships through connection, right? So these are these stages that we go through in SE, although we don't use that language, but this is pretty much exactly what, what happens. This is what can occur in relationship building with horses as well, especially if horses have also experienced difficulties with humans where humans were not safe. Um, getting a chance to help build trust for the human and for the horse can be a really potent process. Peter will call that renegotiation, um, which is not simply about reliving a traumatic experience or about reenactment, um, but about renegotiating. So he defines that mostly as this completing what was incomplete, right? Completing the in, uh, incomplete self-protective responses, moving through immobility and deactivating out the other side. Um, and coming back into agency and aliveness and, and a sense of triumph and, and empowerment and embodiment and all that. Um, but I would also argue that renegotiation also relates to um, the relational repair that can happen. So I'm going to speak briefly about three types of re renegotiation that we do in equine-assisted therapy. So the first is going to be relational renegotiation, um, so experiencing relationships as safe. So feeling felt by the other, responsiveness, attunement, presence, and co-regulation, repairing ruptures, which is this idea of, oh, okay, wow, I missed that. How can I come back and try that again, right? And how do we, how do we repair the, the mistakes that we make in trying to attune to one another, which creates limbic remodeling. This relational safety, which is kind of like in the triphasic model of trauma treatment where we're looking at safety and stabilization first, um, that occurs and then that's going to set the tone for what we do in SC, which is that physiological renegotiation, um, which is a different outcome to familiar situation or dilemma. This is this idea of biological completion of thwarted survival energy, which we need safety in relationship in order to often be able to complete and do with one another. Uh, releasing constriction, tolerating distress and expansion, finding aliveness, experiencing triumph. This, is, this occurs when there's safety in place. Right? So we set the conditions to be able to do this experience. Um, and then there's, I, for lack of a better expression, renegoti renegotiation of sense of self in the world. Um, so experiencing oneself differently in a familiar situation. So increased capacity, growing window of tolerance, better sense of boundaries, uh, integration of self states, because we all have parts, better time orientation, a sense of I can, uh, and so on, which is more about identity and sort of psychophysiology. Uh, in felt sense of self. So equine-assisted therapy 
I believe at its very best, and from the Equisoma perspective, is that it's repair and renegotiation for all. It's not just let's bring this horse in and the horse is really not wanting to be there, but we have to do this thing today because it's clients coming, so the horse is kind of annoyed, but we're going to do this thing anyway. That happens in some forms of equine-assisted therapy from an SC perspective. If it's at the expense of another being, is that not just a reenactment of exploitation or abuse? So we don't want it to be a, renego a reenactment. We want it to be renegotiation for all. So Alexander and French talks about corrective emotional experiences. Um, we'll talk in this context about corrective somatic experiences, corrective relational experiences, and corrective boundary experiences that take place in equisoma. Um, which are as much for the human as for the animal. So it's not that this has to take place at the expense of the horse, but ideally that the horse will get its needs met and perhaps have a chance to renegotiate some of its issues as well in the context of the work. Um, so again, um, injury occurs in relationship, healing can occur in relationship. Um, so I'm going to speak just briefly about um, the International Association uh, for Animal Behavior Consultants. Um, they have some principles that really align with the principles of SE that I think are really lovely. So this idea of not flooding beyond threshold, right? Titration is actually a really important part of what they teach. I don't know how much they know about SE, but there's a lot of really interesting parallels there. Um, they have a principle called LIMA, which is uh, least intrusive, minimally invasive, which really matches up with our idea of titration of thresholds, right? Starting at smaller thresholds and working there and working with ventral vagal engagement, the, the importance of connection as opposed to, you know, higher states that are more necessarily about survival. Um, recognizing the importance of distance, duration, and intensity, which are the ways that we titrate stimuli. NSE, um, that's also used in the IAABC to support deactivation, they'll call it desensitization, which refers to something different in, in human terms, um, but we'll call that deactivation and grow the window of tolerance or confidence. Um, this comes from the IAABC, it's the humane hierarchy of behavior training with animals, not just horses, but with dogs and so on as well. And what I thought was really neat about this is that it in some ways, not completely or perfectly, but in some ways maps what we do in SE as well. So this first piece is here, looking after wellness, nutrition, physical needs, antecedent arrangements are the conditions. Right? What's going on in the relationship with the animal? What's going on with the human's behavior traits? Their dysregulation? What's going on with the dynamics of the relationship? And that's what we do in SE first. We address the conditions, the welfare of the person, the safety. We help build um, the conditions in the environment and the interpersonal relationship to support something different to happen. Often things shift when the conditions are in place without any other intervention other than that, right? which we know about from SE. Um, then they look a little bit more at specific behavior shaping, so positive reinforcement or differential reinforcement of behavior that they're looking for, which is kind of like working with the trauma vortex a little bit um, and working with gradual exposure, working, they, they'll use sometimes just systematic desensitization, working with uh, counter conditioning and so on. And, and we're doing little bits of that, you know, finding the blue and the red or finding the, the, the finding the um, counter vortex in the midst of the trauma vortex. And so they'll do it like a little bit differently, but SD is kind of looking at that as well. Uh, and then last resort will be things like extinction, uh, negative reinforcement, uh, and negative punishment, which we don't do in SE so much, but there this, is this idea of working with higher levels of pressure and release, which sometimes we do do in SE. Um, but again, with a, lot of, with a lot of attunement, it's not about flooding. Um, and, you know, in this case, you know, negative um, reinforcement pressure release methods are fine. I use them as well, but with a lot of attending to thresholds and titration to make sure we're not flooding um, beyond capacity and we're not reinforcing appeasement behaviors and submission um, because that's one of the issues that can happen with negative reinforcement if applied without the titration um, that occurs in SE and um, the attending to thresholds. So that's why they have it a little bit further along the humane hierarchy. Um, I think you can do that in a humane way, um, but again, it requires a lot of this attending to calming signals and distress signals and so on. So this is a diagram that's often used in SE. Um, it originally came from Steve Hoskinson, who gave me permission to include it uh, in my materials. Uh, but this idea of growing the window of tolerance by incremental movement, right? And so this is true for horses as well as for humans as well. 
So Poor just talks about the feeling of safety being the treatment, and this is true. It's, it is exactly what we do in equine-assisted therapy, is how do we start to support feeling safety with one another? An alternative name for this presentation, I was actually going to call it this, co-regulation of horses, renegotiation and repair through the safe haven of connection. And I chose the other one instead, but I wanted to make sure I included this one because it was um, absolutely, it really describes in a nutshell what we do in Equisoma, the, the goal of finding safety uh, with one another. Um, so why horses? Some of you may already know about why we involve horses in the process of equine-assisted interventions in general. I'm going to go through this really um, quickly. Um, but as we know, horses are sentient beings. They have the ability to sense. They, they're conscious. They know what's happening to them. They have choices and decisions and feelings. Um, and they have nervous system responses that are very similar to our own. Um, as I said, uh, the trauma occurs in relationship, so healing occurs in relationship. And healing together is ideal, right, in terms of boundary renegotiation, relational repair. That's really ideal if we can do that with a horse and then have that transfer over to human relationships as well. Um, Oruses will provide what we would call a certain amount of biofeedback in the moment because they don't filter their responses through a, neo, a really big neocortex like we do. They have a neocortex. It's just not as um, prominent as ours is. Um, their responses are pretty um, organic, they're unfiltered, right? So we know right away what their response is to something that we're doing. Um, so tracking, micro-tracking their responses provides really good opportunity for us to micro-track ourselves and know where we're at in our nervous system responses so we can course correct or regulate. Um, they, building relationship with a horse, again, I hate the name transitional object, um, I think, I forget, is that Winnicott, who talks about transitional objects. I don't like that language because the horse is not an object. The horse is a subject in its own life, of course. Um, but the language of transitional objects, relationships with horses, um, can also um, transfer over to relationships with humans. So um, interactions with horses allow us to develop what we call dual awareness. That's not language that's from, from the SC world. I think that's more from things like EMDR. Um, but this idea of being able to hold awareness of myself in the midst of activation, for instance, is a form of dual awareness. But building awareness of self and other, which we would call intersubjectivity, um, the I-thou relationship, it, building awareness of interoception inside myself and extraceptions, what happening, what's happening in the world or in the environment, um, awareness of body and mind, awareness of past and future while in the present moment. Um, awareness of the horse's body responses and our own body responses. Um, we can be aware of co-dysregulation and co-regulation. We can be aware of other things as well. So dual awareness, relationships with horses that are facilitated by someone who has training in SE can allow for this kind of exploration to take place. Um, we can explore themes of consent, right? Where do we have choice? How do we build trust? How do we repair misattunement? And how do we, we, we respond in a relationship with a horse when that's taking place? Working through the completion of biological responses, that can be really interesting. Um, learning how to tolerate bringing up our energy um, in a way that doesn't feel scary or isn't overcoupled with fear or terror can also occur. Um, because setting boundaries or exploring boundaries with horses requires us to bring up our energy to a certain degree. Uh, and coming out of survival physiology into sustainable physiology. Um, I'm sad about this video. This is um, a video of our horse, Ruby. She's one of our horses um, sleeping. And I was going to show you the video so you could actually just sense what it's like for your nervous system to sync up with her as she's breathing and as she's sleeping. Um, she eventually comes out of her sleep briefly to do some rest and digest, nibbling of grass, you know, and so on. And then she comes right back down. She sees me and comes back down into falling asleep again. And so I wanted to offer you an opportunity to have a bit of a nervous system snack, so to speak. Um, but again, that video is on the YouTube um, channel, so I'll send you the link so you can see it in a little bit. Um, which speaks to this idea of co-regulation. So when we're in regulation with each other, a number of things happen. I'm not going to take the time to go through all of this. It will be in the slide. But this opportunity to be in the proximity of a much larger nervous system, especially one that is feeling calm, 
um, in an arrest and digest state or in a state of ventral vagal connection allows for a lot of other things to take place. It's what we support in SE in office when without animals present. We can do it with animals present as well. Um, but it's a really lovely thing that happens with horses too. Um, this is an image that um, the estate of Bonnie Treese has allowed me to use in my materials. Bonnie Treese passed away um, in 2009 or 2010. Um, she was a really strong proponent of the HeartMath Institute's work on um, looking at heart rate variability in horse-human relationships. And, um, and so she had this image commissioned, uh, and her estate has allowed me to use it because I find it really love. It really represents um, this idea of co-regulation and coherence. Right. So when we're in the presence of a presence of a, an organized, coherent, regulated nervous system, ours starts to experience that as well. Um, and so this image here demonstrates the heart field of the horse and the heart field of the human um, and when they start to come into connection with one another, which is this thing that's actually measurable. So the HeartMath Institute um, has looked at the um, electromagnetic fields of various organs of the body, uh, and the, the heart rate field of the heart is 5,000 times stronger than that of the brain. And so that can actually be experienced to a certain degree outside the body. And um, as we know from SE, higher heart rate variability is associated with better health. Lower heart rate variability or more fixed states in the nervous system where there's less variability in the nervous system is poor health states, right? If we're stuck in hyperarousal or hypoarousal, we're stuck in um, this poorer health than if we have uh, a more regulated window of tolerance. And so coherence will support um, a more integrated sense of self, uh, reduced anxiety, reduced confusion, uh, and more ability to be in the world. Um, and so the HeartMath Institute um, has done a few studies on looking at um, horse-human pairs and heart rate variability. And I can actually get you some of these, um, these links to this research if you want to read more about it, um, where the human heart coherence increased significantly in, the, in um, proximity to the horses. Uh, frequencies between horse and human started to match up and sync together. Uh, and in most of the cases, the horse's heart rate variability and heart patterns led the humans. And so there was a pattern of the humans' responses pinging off of the horses and co-regulating along with the horses. Um, during what they call the heart lock-in exercise, which is a gratitude exercise. It's a mindfulness practice of sitting and extending gratitude to the horse uh, in a very intentional way. It's a very blue or uh, counter vortex type of practice um, that supports coherence in the nervous system. Uh, and then just sitting in the presence of a horse as well um, was enough to experience this. Um, more recently, um, some of the same folks conducted more research on heart rate variability in horse-human relationships, uh, in particular with seniors um, in a seniors residential um, community. Um, and they looked at um, doing a particular activity. So this is Barbara Rector's work. She's um, a pioneer in the field of equine-assisted therapy. One of her exercises is called consupermiso, which means with your permission. So it's a consent exercises, uh, exercise of exploring proximity and touch with horses that I absolutely love. Um, and they found that the horse-human um, heart rate variability shifted to low frequency range, which is coherence. Um, and that um, they felt more aliveness without feeling negative stress. So that positive experience of the sympathetic nervous system. Um, as opposed to just stress responses um, that are more about activation. Um, and so what's interesting uh, is that although human nervous systems will trend in the direction of the horse's nervous system, the reverse, at least anecdotally, is also true. I don't know of any research that has covered this yet. Um, but looking at if a horse, a human's nervous system is calm and regulated, can that be a resource for the horse? I know from my own experiences, the more regulated I am, my horses regulate around me. Um, and are less worried or less fearful. So um, I, I don't know, I couldn't find a lot of research on that as of yet, but I would love to see that happen. 
So in equine-assisted psychotherapy and learning activities, there's a number of different standard type of activities that take place or categories of activities that take place. I'm just going to briefly go over this in, in quick detail. Um, so sensory orienting is often a common one. We're in the environment of a farm. We're in nature. We're able to orient in a different way than we can in the office. Um, there's more uh, sensory input to bring our awareness to. Um, that is different from being in man-made settings. And there's actually research around that. There's a lot of research on looking at the human nervous system, um, its response to man-made surroundings versus natural surroundings, and um, an easier time with that. Um, observation over a fence or at a distance, so being able to um, uh, observe horses and notice what's happening in terms of anticipatory charge. Uh, exploring and repairing boundaries with horses um, and figuring out where the horse's boundaries are, where ours are, how do we show responsiveness and attunement to that. Um, shared breathing, you know, just in terms of co-regulation together, mindful grooming with consent of the horse, touch exercises, there's a lot of really neat SE-based touch exercises we can do with humans and with horses together. One of the things I'm really looking forward to this year is I finally have a facility where I can run some sessions from with a, a horse professional um, where I can do table sessions in the presence of the horse herd um, using SE Touch and some of Kathy Kane's work and Steve Terrell's attachment repair work. Uh, so stay tuned. I'm looking forward to maybe doing another webinar on that with y'all. Um, haltering and leading exercises, joining up companion walking, so ha walking with connection. Um, relational attunement, different types of practices we can do at Liberty and around Penn or using different forms of groundwork. Um, sometimes walking through obstacle courses. And again, sometimes there's mounted work in the saddle, so it's not always on the ground. There can be mounted work that can be supportive of all these things of co-regulation, of attachment, connection, safety, and so on. Uh, regulation, especially since we know um, that movement has a regulating effect on the brainstem and on the diencephalon, which are part of the hindbrain where we regulate arousal. Uh, and so movement of a horse can support that kind of regulatory experience. Um, clicker training to build positive reinforcement for horses. Feral horse gentling, where we're working with feral horses to help them be less afraid of humans. There's so many different versions of equine-assisted therapy. It's really remarkable. Um, and any of these can be done by integrating somatic experiencing and an attachment lens. Um, interactions that support safety and connection. So um, these things also can take place in the context of um, relationships with horses. So it's actually a really neat adjunct to in-office equine um, in assisted therapy. That would be a really large office <laughs> that would accommodate a horse. Um, there's a lot that we can do in, in the context of incorporating SE into equine assisted interventions with that trauma lens in place. Um, so I won't say uh, more about that right now. Um, I'm just going to go through some of this. These are more examples of things that we can do in equine assisted therapy. I wanted to take a few minutes before we go to wrap up because we're getting close to time. We're within 10 minutes now. We started a few minutes late um, with some examples, just talking a little bit about what this can look like. It's not absolutely the, um, the extent of it, but this is uh, an experience. This, this actually. I'm actually kind of happy I have these photos. Um, this was my first experience as a client in equine assisted therapy over 10 years ago. And so um, this is the eye is actually of the eye of that horse. That's a horse named Hawk. Um, and uh, this was my first time going to an equine assisted therapy workshop. And um, it was actually an introduction to Barbara Rector's work. The, the person in question was using different methods, um, but mostly largely out of that world or that particular approach. Um, and this particular experience was really fascinating from an SE lens. Without going into tons of detail, I was in a huge amount of shame um, around being seen. I did not grow up with horses. I grew up in, on rural country roads. I grew up surrounded by farms, but did not ever have horses myself. And so came into horses as an adult um, and always felt a lot of imposter syndrome around being around horses and going to this workshop for the first time brought up all my shame uh, and an intimidation around being around people who I perceived as having all this horse experience that I did not have. And I went immediately into my, I need to know how to do this, I need to you know, figure it out, all the intellectualization. And, um, and I was very, very activated, like extremely so. And I was, I was standing with Hawk and avoiding the gaze of everyone in the 
that were sitting around the round pen watching this particular interaction. Um, and the facilitator at one point, as I was kind of modulating my own arousal and working through all this shame response, um, eventually said, you know, how would it be for you to walk along the edge of the round pen and make eye contact with everyone? Well, <laughs> if I were to do this again as an experience, I would, have, I would do it quite differently because that was asking for something that was well beyond my threshold at the time. And so how I reg moderated that or titrated it for myself, I did not know the language of titration back then. I was only just starting to get introduced to SE back in about 10 years ago. Um, how I titrated it for myself is I took off my glasses so that I could orient to the people's faces. I could see where their eyes were, but I didn't have the intensity of actually having their knowing, like seeing their gaze. Um, and so that was one of the ways that I was able to titrate into ventral vagal connection in the face of shame. And as I started to walk around the edge of the round pen, um, the facilitator said, look behind you. Because yeah. um, I had left Hawk with her to go and walk. And he had chosen to follow me unbeknownst to me. And he had his nose. It's not in this photo so much. Um, but he had his nose at the small of my back. And he kept his head there as I moved from person to person, supporting me and providing that containment and that safety and that secure attachment for me to do this thing that was quite arousing. And uh, he provided that co-regulation for me to do this thing that was kind of a little bit at threshold um, for me. And um, I'll never forget it. It was the thing that brought me into this area of work. So I wanted to bring that up because I thought it was a really lovely example of what it can look like and how it can be helpful. Like I said, I would have titrated it a little bit more knowing what I know about SD. Um, but it was a really potent experience anyway from a polyvagal perspective. Um, this is an example of a client um, with PTSD. I have her consent to share these images uh, interacting with my horse, Brando, uh, during an equine therapy session um, where um, she's sitting calmly and um, exploring connection with him. So she went and sat sort of in the middle-ish of the round pen um, and she was working on just being present in her body, feeling her feet on the ground. Uh, and he walked over to her uh, and was spending some time with her. So he was smelling her, um, exploring her through touch. Um, and because there was a lot of uh, unsafe touch for this person, it was interesting to see her experience that within her own body. You know, what's that coming up for her? Is, is this okay? You know, and she was able to actually be in the proximity with him. And what was really lovely, this was a beautiful example of shared connection and shared renegotiation. Um, Brando went through a trauma a few years ago uh, involving flooding, um, not flooding as in water, but stimuli, stimulus flooding, where he now has a fear sometimes when he's feeling unconfident, he has a fear of things moving around him. Um, and we worked really hard on using SE and different horsemanship methods to help him build some confidence around things. Um, that are moving and to titrate his arousal. Um, and so she had a hat on. And one of the traumatic experiences that he had involved someone taking their hat off and him losing his mind um, when he was feeling rather unconfident. And so we, as, as a result of the co-regulation, as a result of the safety and her titrating, she was actually able to take the hat off and he was able to stay in ventral vagal connection with her. So it was this lovely little moment of, and then just relax, bring his head down. You know, it wasn't submission. He was very much engaged with her. Um, his facial expression was not tuned out. You know, he was present and sniffing and stayed curious, so he was able to stay in that ventral vagal state um, with her, in, even though she did a scary thing, which was to remove her hat So, um, and then hold it. So that was actually a really cool thing. So you can see him in this last photo here coming down and actually um, showing curiosity or exploratory orienting to the thing that normally can be scary for him. Um, and then her putting the hat on the ground and then just enjoying a moment of, of connection with him. We're right at noon, um, my time. I'm not going to go too much longer through some of these photos. I'm just going to um, maybe talk about this one really quickly. So this was a really neat example of renegotiation and repair. So this particular client, uh, who gave me permission to take these photos. So she, um, uh, ha oh, I also have permission to share this story. So sh she is a former first responder um, who experienced a lot of PTSD, not just in the context of her work, but also through her work team. Like she had a partner who, um, you know, betrayed her and there was a lot of unsafety within her work team and with her partner. 
Um, and so she didn't feel like she had someone had her back. And so this particular day, we went out to the herd, and um, we went and stood. And on the right, I'm not sure if there's um, I don't know if there's um, the group of three horses. I don't know if you can all see my my cursor moving. Maybe not. Um, but the horses over on the right-hand side of the screen um, that are closest to her, they came up and stood next to her in a line and um, showed, showed curiosity and came and hung out. Um, and then the other three horses that are just behind her came and stood behind her in a line. And then the last one fully on the left came and stood and held up the end of the line over there. And they're a, those are all ba um, bachelors. They're not bachelors. It's not a wild herd. They are all geldings. Um, and so. Um, and part of her experience in her field was um, that she was in a field dominated by men and there was a lot of toxic masculinity and a lot of issues going on and didn't really feel safe. So it was really neat to see this line of male horses show up and create this thin blue line, which is what we call the police force in um, some places. Uh, and there was this really neat moment. So the horse that's closest to the client's face um, that dark horse there um, is known for being, well, it's humans um, know this horse to be pushy, domineering, um, lacking in respect of boundaries, and so on. And what was really neat to watch her do was titrate into this idea of consent with touch. And, you know, bringing her hand closer and then pulling it away and titrating at the, the, the edge of tolerance with this horse and watching the stress responses in the horse, tracking her own stress responses, and then eventually over the course of about 10, 15 minutes, being able to bring contact to the horse with the horse settling and feeling comfortable and sharing some moments of connection, shared breath, mutual touch that were quite respectful. Um, and then eventually, in time, after those 15 minutes were, were done, it was almost like the, the interaction wrapped up organically by itself. Another group of horses that are not visible in this image came in, pushed these three out of the way, uh, and broke up the thin blue line. And the horse that she'd been engaging with, rather than sort of bumping into her and bumping forward, actually sidestepped and went out of his way to walk around her, which I, I don't think was a coincidence. I think there was a bit of renegotiation and repair that occurred there um, for that particular horse around, you know, hey, I can see that you're attuning to my needs and my boundary, and it attuned to hers, which is very different from um, other humans' interpretations of how this horse can be. And so it was really neat to see um, that repair occur for her so that when push came to shove, so to speak, you know, that horse had her back, which was the repair that didn't get to happen with her coworker. Um, so it was, it was really, really a neat and powerful session. Those are the only ones I actually have consent to speak about. I would love to do a workshop or a webinar for you on incorporating parts work with equine assisted therapy because um, parts work and ego state work with equine therapy is really fascinating and I have some lovely examples of incorporating SE and parts work and equine therapy together as well. Um, so I'm just going to wrap up with this. So in Equisoma, a few things that we do um, include uh, multi-level observation during the activities um, of uh, the client nervous systems, the animal's nervous system, um, these, uh, the facilitator's nervous systems, if there are co-facilitators, what's going on between the co-facilitators, because there can be traumatic reenactments between co-facilitators and equine assisted therapy if we're not careful and if that stuff is not addressed. So we want to monitor for those things uh, and the collective nervous system as a whole. In Equisoma, some of the other things that we're doing as well is looking at, we're mapping out window of tolerance, we're mapping activation cycle, polyvagal states, we're looking at thresholds of intensity, and we're looking at boundary rupture zones. Um, so uh, those are some things. We're backing away, approach retreat, we're looking at capacity building. Um, Nine-step model of SC, I'm just going to bypass this because we're right at time. So I'm going to just wrap up with this idea that some colleagues of mine like to say, so Bettina Schultz-Job and Tim Job are the founders of a model called Natural Likemanship, which is another model of equine therapy that I think is really neat. Uh, and they say a good principle is a good principle regardless of where it is applied. And so this is certainly the case for SE and working with horses. So Levine says you will get there faster by going slower. In SE, we will say titrate at the edge of the window of tolerance. And Ray Hunt, who's a really famous horseman, has once said, try to stay on the edge of trouble. If your horse starts to really get troubled, back off and do less, which is what we do in SE. And so I wanted to leave you on that note. 
Um, Mary Oliver passed away recently, and I love her quote, Wild Geese, and this is really just speaking to the importance of attunement and ventral vagal connection and secure attachment. You only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. So thanks all for your attention and for sticking it out for the entire hour. Um, I, some people had to leave, and, I, and that's great. Um, the audio recording will be available shortly. I think Denise is here and will um, share a little bit more about um, some of the next steps. Denise? Yeah. Oh, thank you so much, Sarah. Uh, Sarah. Thank you for sharing all of that great information. That was, that was uh, a lot of wonderful information and just beautiful, beautiful slides. Um, We've got, I forgot to show the training information, so for those of you who are interested, Equisoma Training Basics uh, are coming up this year, so we're really excited to roll that out. A number of you who are in on the call are actually, um, have expressed interest in attending or are going to be assisting for the training or offering personal sessions for those of uh, you who need to complete your hours to do the training. Um, the first one will be in Ottawa, Canada this July. The second one will be in the south of France. Uh, actually at an SD facility, which is really great. The owner is an SDP, um, so looking forward to that. And I also have a horse horse workshop in Toronto near the airport uh, on some of these principles, so two-day on trauma-informed horsemanship, so looking at integrating SD into horse-human relationships. Uh, so those are coming up, and more information about that can be found at equisoma.com. Well, Sarah, I have a question about that. Is this is that training for experienced horse people and SEPs only? Great question. So the training actually is seeking to bring in two streams of people together. So the first stream of people who have expressed interest in the training is people who are trained in equine-assisted therapy already, regardless of modality. So um, the, the big thing there is going to be if you don't have somatics or attachment as a background, you don't have trauma as a background, but you already do equine therapy and you kind of want to really bring in a somatic and attachment perspective to this work and understand polyvagal theory and nervous system tracking way better, um, then it's open to people who have a background already pre-existing in equine assisted therapy. Those folks are being asked to do 10 sessions of SE, either with a SETI approved provider or one of the Equisoma approved providers that's listed on the website. Um, and then the second stream of folks is people who are in the SE world, so current SE students or SEPs, um, and potentially as on an as needed basis, people who trained in SE related modalities, so that includes things like sensory motor psychotherapy or self-regulation therapy or somatic transformation or um, uh, organic intelligence, like the offshoots of SE or that evolved out of SE, um, are welcome to take this training as well, who may or may not have horse background or equine-assisted therapy training if they would like to learn more about how to bring horses into somatic experiencing work to increase that part of their practice. And so um, the idea is to have these two streams coming together. People in the SC world who do not have experience with equine-assisted therapy are requested to do 10 sessions of equine-assisted therapy regardless of approach just to get an introductory feel for it. And then as a group together, we'll have these two streams learning from one another's areas of expertise as we teach the Equisoma model. So that's the whole goal. So it's ideally going to aim for these two populations coming together. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Great. Um, Interesting. All right. Well, thanks again, Sarah. We're so grateful to you for sharing Good. all of that amazing information with us. And um, members, you will receive a recording of the webinar, and Sarah's going to share uh, some links to some YouTube videos and a few other things uh, with you when I send out that recording. Um, mm -hmm. And so I'll try to get that out to you today. Again, Great. Sarah, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, and so we are going to close for now. I wish everyone a wonderful rest of the day um, and look forward to seeing this um, webinar in your, in your inbox in a little while. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.